Alive. Hey everybody! Welcome to the OOP class this morning. It's the last class of the semester. So, um, yeah, like we did in the last few weeks, I'm trying out this uh, YouTube streaming thing. The video quality is much better. You can just ask questions in the chat there as uh, we're going through the various different things that we're going to do in today's class. But anyway, it's our last class, right? We've been doing little bits of yoga and Wim Hof um, every, every class. So why not begin today's last class with a little bit of yoga and uh, we'll do three rounds of Wim Hof breathing as well. Uh, just to like basically charge our brains up and charge our bodies up with loads and loads of good oxygen. So we're going to do that to begin and then I want to go through the YASC example program that we have been putting together over the last few weeks and just to sort of look like look at basically how the we were able to learn these things or, or how it's an example of these things like polymorphism, inheritance, encapsulation, interfaces, abstract classes. So these are like big OO concepts and then we can see how those were implemented in the YASC game and we'll draw a little class diagram of that. And then afterwards, I'm going to switch over into uh, Unity Game Engine, and we're going to make a little thing in Unity. Uh, and the reason why I think this is very uh, useful is because Unity like has a sort of different way of doing classes, which is a thing called, uh, you know, it's one of the design patterns for the Gang of Four book that I talked about previously, the Elements of Reusable Software Design book. So it uses like this uh, component design pattern, which is really, really interesting. And, you know, just to compare it with how we kind of like learned OO from the YASC example, I think will be really useful for us. So that's the plan for today's class, everybody. I have the chat open here in one window. So, you know, if there's any questions or comments, uh, just put them in the chat as we are, you know, going along with today's class. Right, let's do some programmer yoga. So, very important to keep our uh, minds and bodies fit. Oh yeah, I'll just turn this around here. Particularly because we're stuck indoors a lot of the time and we're stuck using screens. So, yeah. These are just some, some yoga, you know, poses that I do every day. Um, I find it really, really useful and nice. Let's do this thing here. So guys, if you can find us a little bit of spare space, yeah, let's see. Uh, do you need to download Unity? Actually, that's a good idea. Somebody just says in the chat. Yeah, if you want to follow along, download the latest version of Unity and you can follow along with the Unity example. Anyway, let's begin. So find a little clear space in your room uh, where you can move about a little bit and maybe move on the floor is really good. If you're seated, you'll still be able to do probably about 50% of these. And uh, so, so begin just by allowing your head to go all the way to the left and all the way to the right. Feeling a good stretch in the back of your neck. So again, if you're sitting at your screen for a long time, it's a good idea like every now and again to just stop and take a little break and do some of these stretches. And looking all the way to the left, all the way to the right. So head all the way forward, rolling all the way until your head gets to the front again and then change direction, go in the opposite direction. So, yeah, so uh, place your two hands, place your hands just below your shoulders. You can bend your knees a little bit for this one. And the aim is to try and bring your elbows all the way in so that they, they touch at the front and then rolling your shoulders all the way back as far as feels comfortable. Kind of feeling the stretch, you know, when you go back across the front of your chest. So now change direction. Take your hands, uh, bring your elbows together, and remember how this one works. It's basically elbows back, 
together, and then hands back. Alright, take the left hand and then bend the fingers all the way back on the left hand so you can feel a stretch on the back of your left arm. And change direction, give the fingers a little bit of a wiggle. Now try the right arm stretched all the way out, feeling a stretch. Bend the fingers back, feel a stretch on the back of your right arm. And change direction, give the fingers a little bit of a wiggle. So take the hands, bring them together, rotate your wrists. And change direction, go in the opposite direction. Great, so moving down the body. Uh, right toes pointed forward, stepping a little bit wider than shoulder width. Left toes pointed at 45 degrees. Allow your left hand to go down the left side of your body and the right hand up into the air. Give your fingers a little bit of a wiggle. Look up towards your fingertips. And then stretch your arm right the way over, feeling a stretch in the right side of your body. Coming up to stand again, and we try the same stretch now on the right side. Reaching all the way over. Oh yeah. So moving down the body. Uh, now just bend your knees and rotate your hips. Then changing direction. So now place your hands on your knees and rotate your knees. Okay, standing on your left leg, rotating the right ankle. And then change direction. Going back to stand, now switch over and rotating the left ankle. And then change direction. Wonderful. Shake out your body a little bit. And we'll try. Uh, some forward bend and we'll see where we go from there so uh, yeah so start with your hands together take a dig a big inhale and reach your hands back over your back and hold the stretch there for a few seconds then exhale Reaching down towards your toes with your hands as far as feels comfortable. And trying to get a little bit deeper with every exhale. And if you feel it, you can grab the back of your legs. Try and bring your head in towards your knees. Let your two, let your hands come together <clears throat> and just hold the stretch. Hang out here for a few breaths, letting everything in the shoulders just relax. Now allow your hands to fall to the ground. Walk your hands out a little bit. I'm going to turn around this way. So now you can just let your legs stretch out as far as they can. Yep, this looks good. And hold the stretch for a few seconds. Then walk your hands out a little bit. Bring your knees in towards the ground. And then bring your ankles in together. And just hold the stretch here a little bit, feeling a stretch on your inner thighs. 
you can rock back and forwards then again just to loosen up that area even more. Oh yeah. So now I'm coming into a seated position. And from here, bring your legs into the front. Take your hands, reach forward towards your toes. Try and grab your toes. Bring your head in towards your knees. And if you can't go like the full way with this stretch, just go as far as feels comfortable. All right, coming up to a seated position. Uh, you can sit with your left leg tucked in underneath your right knee. And these ones are really good for programmers, I have to say. Um, I play a flute as well, as you guys know. So again, these stretches I find really good for loosening up this area here, which, you know, if you're like playing the flute for a long time or coding for a long time, this is an area that you tend to carry a lot of tension. So, take your right elbow, use your left arm for balance, reach your right elbow underneath your knee, and try, if you can, to grab your hands at the back. Join your two hands together, and then raise your head up and look forward. So that what you're doing here is really, really stretching the right shoulder, and like pulling the right shoulder kind of away so it gets a, a good kind of stretch. But you just go as far as, you know, feels comfortable with these ones. You don't have to do yourself, uh, you know, just whatever your body's limits are, yeah? You don't need to feel any pain. So now take the same stretch with you on the other side. So now you can uh, take your right leg tucked underneath your left knee. Left arm then goes underneath using right arm for balance. And then join your hands at the back if you can. Bring your head up. Oh my God, this is so good. Oh, wonderful. Let's try some spinal twists. Well, I'm enjoying this more than I thought. This might go on for a while. All right, same starting position. Now you can take the, the left elbow to the far side of your right knee and then Spinal twist, looking over the right shoulder. Nice. So try the other side. Uh, right, left leg up in the air, right elbow, and then look over the left shoulder. So good. Let's try the finish I think yeah because we could could spend all day doing yoga we'll do just one or two more just because like I feel I need to do like one or two just to loosen everything up properly so we'll try a uh, downward dog and we'll try into the cobra then oh so the downward dog you can start by uh, well what you're doing here is like to your legs at the back here and then you're standing on your hands trying to bring your bum up into the air and then push back with your hands so you can feel a good stretch on the back of your uh, calf muscles. Mm. You know what, we could try a few little variations here. You can stand on your right leg, bring the left leg all the way up. Oh yeah. And let's try the other side. And let's drop then down into the cobra. Very nice. You can come onto all fours and then drop down into the child's pose. Wonderful. That's it for the stretching, everybody. That's it. Namaste. Oh, okay.
Okay, let's do uh, three rounds of uh, the Wim Hof breathing. So remember Wim Hof breathing, everybody. 30 inhales and exhales. And then on the last breath, you exhale completely. And uh, just as Wim Hof says, let the body do what the body does. So you let all the oxygen, you know, just that you've been building up over those 30 breaths, just like you know, saturate your body and saturate your brain. And it gives you a great lift. And if you feel any kind of brain fog or anything, you can try these Wim Hof breathings and you'll find it just like gives you really, really nice mental clarity. Apparently it's very good for the immune system and everything as well. So let's try three rounds together. If you're still sitting at your computers, you can do these Wim Hof breaths uh, or like find a place you can sit down on the ground. And let's do, Let's do some breathing together. So, let me go center a little bit. Awesome. All right, we begin first round. So 30 inhales and exhales, and then exhale completely, and just like I say, just allow yourself to experience that lovely feeling of all the oxygen in your body. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be good, right? Good. All right, everybody, let's try the second round. So 30 inhales and exhales, and then retain the last breath and uh, let the body do what the body does.
everybody. Let's try one more uh, round of 30 breaths. And I'll get on to doing some coding then after that. I hope everybody feels as good as I do. Tim Hop breathing is really powerful. Okay. <clears throat> Alright everybody, come back to earth after that amazing uh, breathing that we all did together. I feel, you know, that was uh, very powerful for me anyway. Uh, okay, so I'm going to just move my camera over here now. Uh, let's begin doing some coding, you guys. Just, uh, ah yeah, thank you people commenting in the chat. It is, isn't it? Like... The first, the first round, he usually does like 30 seconds, and then the second round, like it's 60 seconds, and the third round, he holds it for 90 seconds. So like obviously your body is oxygenated from the first two rounds, you still have all that oxygen flowing around your body. You know what comes into my head when I do Wim Hof breathing? It's that expression, getting high on your own supply. Like, you literally... Uh, just need to sit there and breathe in a particular way and like you get all these amazing benefits so anyway that's Wim Hof breathing download the app and uh, yeah I'm gonna switch over now to do the screen share thing right okay guys so for the last, I guess, guess, three or four weeks, we have been building this little game called Yask, right? This little bit of a game called Yask. We could keep on going and we could add physics and the loading screen and the splash screen and the gravity and all the rest of it, right? But if you want to know how hey, well, that stuff works, maybe come to my Game Engines course in fourth year because I teach all of that stuff. But anyway, um, 
so we have been able to like learn a lot of OO principles by making this little game, right? So let's run the thing, see what it looks like. Just have a quick look through the code again one more time, and then let's draw a class diagram so we can see how these like classy things work and polymorphism works in this game thing that we've been making. So after that, we're gonna like look at Unity and see how Unity kind of like does the same type of, uh, you know, like keeping track of things basically it on the screen okay let's run it see what it does right so i'm gonna you guys hopefully can all see okay cool uh gonna click start debugging this is all pushed to the repo yeah the only small change i like you might just need to modify the main method all right so here we go we got two game objects on the screen here at the moment oh yeah because maybe the things are not respawning whoa this has a bug because look the players just turned green that's interesting never mind the player is able to move around the player can collect these things the player can create bullets. The bullets have a lifetime, and then the bullets disappear after a certain time. And uh, you can see the number of game objects. In the game objects, array goes now down to one, because there's only one game object. And what we kind of like had worked on is originally we kept track of bullets in its own array list, and now we're keeping track of everything in one array list, which is an array list of game objects. And all the things that we see on the screen are as subclasses of game objects some of them also implement an interface as well so we got interfaces we've got abstract classes we have an array list we've got polymorphism so in terms of the code there is a game object base class and this game uh, it's called a base class in c sharp in java it's called a super class there's a game object super class for everything and it is an abstract class an abstract class means the class cannot be instantiated. It almost it, it, it should have some abstract methods. The abstract methods on the abstract class don't have to have any method body, they're just a semicolon. And then any class that extends game object has to implement those methods. Otherwise, that class is also an abstract class. So that's the purpose of an abstract class. It is the kind of like you can put some code in it. You can, it can have a constructor, it can have methods with bodies, it can have fields on it, it can also have abstract methods on it. Um, so that's what kind of like distinguishes it from an interface, which is just methods, uh, just method signatures, right? So this is our abstract class game object. And then we have the player, which is an extension of game object. The player extends game object and implements its own render and update method. We have health, that's also an extension of the game object. And it has its own render and its own update method. Ammo similarly has help and has, has render and update methods. And so does the bullet. So all of these things are subclasses of game object. That's, a, that's a inheritance. Here uh, in the Yask class, right? The Yask is sort of like the owner for all of these things. This is like a has our relationship with everything else, all these other classes. It has an array list of game objects. So this array list can contain any subclass of the game object superclass. And then when you call go.update and go.render, this calls the appropriate methods on the appropriate subclasses of game object. So if it's a bullet, it calls bullet render. If it's a uh, player or a ship, it calls the ship render. Now, this, by the way, is an example of another thing in programming. This is called dynamic method binding. So that means that, like, because this is polymorphism, this could be any of the, like, any of a number of different methods might get called here, depending on what the instance is. Yeah. So, at runtime, the runtime actually has to look up and see, hey, what type is this, and then what is the appropriate method that I call. So that's called dynamic method binding. Um, you know, we're talking about the difference. Or later, we'll talk about the difference between C sharp and Java. Every method in these are also called virtual methods in C++. Um, these methods in Java are always virtual, right? C sharp, by contrast, you can say whether you want to use static or dynamic binding. So, but in Java, it's always dynamic binding. It's always polymorphism in Java. In C sharp, it could call the superclass update method or the superclass render method, depending on what annotations you put in your code, because C sharp supports both ways. Java, everything is dynamic binding. So like. That's just a little note that you might want to write there. Or if you ever come across that static and dynamic binding thing, now you know what it means. Okay, so it's super class. This, this keeps track of all of the things. 
the other thing we did was we made an interface and we called this interface uh, power up and on power up this has just got one method on it called apply to and so the ammo and the help implement that interface so what does that mean they implement the apply to method and so in yask then one last thing we did here is we now iterate through all the game objects and we you know for the collision test and we basically do something special if they're power-ups if they're power-ups we do a collision test and we call the apply to method and we used instance of which is an operator in java that basically tells you if one thing implements an interface or is a subclass or something or if it's an interface or if it's a class of a particular type you can use this to check to see that so that is the code and that kind of brings us up to last week's the end of last week's class one last thing I want to do on this before we switch over to the Unity is I want to draw a class diagram. And we'll compare how these classes work to how like classes work in Unity. Let me get a bit of blank space here on my whiteboard. Here we go. Blank space on the whiteboard. Okay, bring this over onto the other screen. Everybody kind of dig in this. If you've got any questions, shout them into the chat, right? Here's the whiteboard. Here's the pen. Here we go. Oop, turn it over. So this is a class diagram, right? So we've got this super class. And this is called game object. And then there are subclasses of game object. There's one which is called, do we call it ship or player? I think we call it player, player. So this is what this little symbol means. It means extends. So player extends game object and so does a bullet and so does uh, ammo no bullet health and so does ammo so they all extend game object right let me move this thing around a little bit and just show you the, the, the okay so we've got health and ammo i probably should have drawn those on the same side because also we need a little bit more room here because we need to put in let me get rid of the ammo from over there and put it in over here instead and then also there's this power up thing going on here as well power up thingy here and these guys all implement the power up interfaces so power up interface so that's kind of like a class diagram of it. The one thing we're missing here is the actual Yask class. So the Yask class is extending P applet. You could put that in there as well. But then there's a relationship between Yask and game objects in that this is a, like a one-to-many relationship. So one-to-many relationship means like Yask keeps track of these. This is a reference, you know. So that's, is that cool for everybody? If anybody has any comments or wants to ask a question, but that is a class diagram for those like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes that we made, you know, or seven different things. Uh, and that's basically how it all fits together. Alrighty. So, uh, yeah, okay. So that's basically how, um, you know, how we, how we made that little game. Okay, so let's switch over into Unity. Before we switch over into Unity, let's talk a little bit about Unity. And I want to actually draw a class diagram here because I want to show you how OOP and Unity works. That's the purpose of today. So, first of all, Unity is a game engine. I think it's probably about 10 years old. It is, um, you use C Sharp to program things in Unity if you've never seen it. It is kind of like, here, let me show you. It's kind of like the biggest... Um, okay, I'd say it's probably the most popular in colleges and amongst indie game developers, but also there's loads of AAA games made with Unity as well. And yeah, you can download it for free. Uh, as a student, you're entitled to get a student version of Unity, which gives you a few extra features. What else to say about it? It's highly, highly fun and addictive. Once you start coding stuff in Unity, like you'll just like lose track of time and you'll start thinking about it all the time and dreaming about it and waking up in the morning time and you want to go code Unity all the time. It's amazing, it's so powerful. You can program anything from like a, a game that runs on a Tizen mobile phone and you can take the same source code and you can deploy it all the way up into a big VR project, maybe for like a high-end gaming PC. And Unity supports development on all of those different platforms. 
it's primarily for games and for simulations and for 2D and 3D stuff, but people have made apps out of Unity as well, though it's a bit of a, like, a not really designed for it. So that's just a little background to Unity, right? Um, here are the main classes that you're going to interact with if you're doing Unity development. First of all, you deal with a class called the Game Object. So Unity has Game Objects too. So you got a game object, right? This is kind of like, yeah, Unreal versus Unity. Unreal, somebody, uh, people are saying in the chat, bad reputation for you. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Unreal uses C++. You know, you, you, like Unity has this high definition render pipeline and everything. So you can even make things that are look photorealistic in, in Unity. But I'm not going to focus too much on that today. I want to focus really on like OOP in Unity, you know? Because it's like something that even if you never program in Unity, this way of doing OOP is, is like very, very interesting and useful to know how like a big like game engine with like millions of users does classes and things like that. Anyway, there's a class called a game object in Unity, right? A game object keeps track of one thing and this is called a transform, right? So uh, each game object has one transform. Then there's this other thing in Unity called a mono behavior. There's this thing in Unity called a mono behavior. And this isn't an inheritance, but this is basically a one to many relationship. So one game object can have many mono behaviors. And many mono behaviors, and all of these mono behaviors are actually what implements the behavior thing, right? So you got this mono behavior thing. This is, mono behavior so, sometimes are referred to as components, but Unity also has a thing called the entity component system. So I don't, don't want to confuse them by calling them components, but you often see them referred to as components. So any like bit of C sharp code that you want your program to implement, so you want your your thing to move or respond to input from a game controller, or handle a collision with another object is going to be a subclass of mono behavior. So like any user defined scripts, any user stuff, I'll just put this here, generic user stuff. Okay, all of this extends mono behavior, right? There's also like some built in things in Unity that extend mono behavior, which um, let's see here, I'll draw the diagram this way. There are these things called uh, renderers. Okay. Okay, so basically there's renders which are subclasses of mono behavior. And if you want your game object, your thing in Unity to draw itself to the screen, you add a renderer to it. And then there's lots of subclasses of renderers. So one of the subclasses of renderers is called a mesh renderer. So a mesh renderer is used to render 3D objects. And then also there are um, other subclasses. There's a thing called a line renderer. And there's a sprite renderer as well for 2D. They all extend renderer thingies. So you got game object, you got mono behaviors, you got renderers, you got uh, any of your user scripts then are also subclasses of mono behavior and they get added to the game object. The game object is considered like a container for all the mono behaviors. Um, something else that's gonna extend mono behaviors is if you want to implement physics, you have this thing called a rigid body. So if you want it to be you know, use the physics engine in Unity, you add a rigid body to it. If you want it to respond to collisions, you add a collider to it. And then there's lots of subclasses of collider. There's things called like a, a mesh collider. And there's like a sphere collider and there's a box collider and stuff like that. So I'll just put in sphere collider. So, let me see, what else? Yeah, these are the main classes of Unity, right? You want to put, write code in Unity. Uh, let's see, you got a mesh render, you got mesh. There, there's other classes that we'll come across. These are, oh, hang on a second, materials, render materials. These are things, okay, these are these are the main classes. There's, there's others, there's others that we'll get to and you'll see when we actually code stuff in Unity. These are all the, like, you can see basically how, you know, we, the, the game object is not a super class or anything. The game object is a container for mono behaviors. This is called um, the component design pattern. 
So all these mono behaviors are kind of like referred to as components. You add components to a game object in order to get it to implement different things. I'll maybe just throw up a couple of other classes here. Or actually, maybe just in relation to the transform. The transform keeps track of lots of things. So there's a one-to-one -one here between stuff like the position. Uh, sorry, not the position. Maybe the class is not the right thing here. Vector 3. Oh. No, this is not right. These should be fields. Vector 3. Yeah, so this shouldn't be here at all. Let me get rid of all of that. Oh. Yeah, transform has things like position. Uh, it has rotation and stuff like that. These are other types of classes. I'll just put them up here. These are called vector 3s. For stuff like position and scale and so on. And for rotation, Q-U-A-T-E-R-N-I-O-N. We use this data structure called a quaternion. Now, again, like just an interesting thing to know here is these guys are all classes. These are all classes. These things, on the other hand, are not actually classes. A vector three has things like X, Y, and Z fields, and it has lots of methods on it, like normalize and stuff like that, but it's not actually a class. Again, like the this is one of the reasons, you know, one of the major differences between C sharp and Java is C sharp also has this thing called a struct, and a struct is like like a class. It looks like a class, but it is what's called a value type rather than a reference type. Um, if we have time later, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. But it just means these actually get created on the stack. These get created on the heap. These guys have to be garbage collected. These guys don't have to be garbage collected. These guys are more like floats or ints. They're like primitive types, but they actually can contain uh, fields in them. So that's what a struct versus a class is in C Sharp. Again, that's one of the major differences between the two languages. One of the other differences between the two languages is that C Sharp supports a feature called operator overloading. What is operator overloading? Operator overloading means that you can write something like this. You can go vector three. You can go something like A equals B plus C. And these guys can be vectors. These guys can be vectors, you know, not just primitive types. And if you were to try and write this in Java, you'd have to go something like this. A equals, you'd have to write something like this. P vector dot add. So you have to actually call a method in order to do um, B comma C. Whereas in C sharp, you can write code like this. A equals B plus C. These guys are vectors and it will add the X's together, add the Y's together and so along. Because this plus symbol here is overloaded and it actually calls a method when you do this. This is called operator overloading. I think Python supports it. C++ definitely has operator overloading. C sharp has it. This is one of the main reasons I think why C sharp is the language for programming games as opposed to Java. You know, number one, the structs, which are what are called aggregate value types, and then also because it has operator overloading, so you can write code like this, and it's much easier to write physics code and stuff like that. So, you guys, that is the little introduction to the main classes in Unity. I'm now going to fire up Unity, and we're going to make a little Hello World program in Unity, and see how all of these classes kind of work together. So here is the Unity thing, right? Downloaded the Unity thing. If you guys want, by the way, you can code along here with me and, and just like you'll get familiar with the Unity thing. I hope that little explanation of how classes work in Unity and, you know, you can look at that diagram again. That's kind of how OO is done in, you know, real kind of commercial OO development. It's not necessarily always done by extending things. You usually are going to like implement interfaces a lot of the time and you're going to see more kind of like patterns like that. There's one of the rules in the Gang of Four book, and it's always favor aggregation over inheritance. So you always try and do this sort of component way of doing things rather than extend superclasses all the time. Okay, here is the Unity thing. I'm going to click New and create a new uh, Unity project here. Let me just call this Hello Unity. And where we're going to uh, let's put it here in my Documents folder, and I'm going to click Create. Right, you guys, I need to step outside for just two minutes. Not even two minutes, I'll be right back. Uh, I'll just a B, B or B, okay?
Okay, I'm back. Right. Um, hey, listen, before I start this Unity thing here, will you just like put a note, say in the chat if you're going to code along. I just want to know how many people are coding along with me. All right, we'll begin. Woo! -hoo! This is a new Unity project, everybody. This is what you get when you launch Unity. It looks like this. So, what have you got here? We have these different uh, like views which can be kind of dragged around. You can rearrange things, you know, depending on um, you know what you need to see on the screen at any time. And there's a number of these. These, by the way, these can also kind of like be docked and dragged around in various different ways. It's hard to get them to dock again. I always find. There we go. I'll just explain what everything on. Oh, okay. I'll just. Okay, cool. No problem, Mattis. Yeah, maybe I should have let people know I was going to do this Unity thing so people could install it. But you can, I guess you could watch back anyway, right? Uh, but it'd be nice if you could follow along and if you have Unity installed, like follow along. Okay, cool. So the different sort of like views that we have here of the, uh, these are all views of the current Unity project, right? This here is called the scene view. And like the scene view kind of just shows you everything that's in your scene in Unity. <clears throat> a scene is like, you know, a collection of all the things that are kind of visible at any one time. This thing here is called a hierarchy. And this is, a, this is your scene again, but this is your scene in a, a sort of a hierarchical form. And this is like every, every, everything you see in the hierarchy is a game object with a transform. So um, there's a camera in the scene and in this scene there's also a directional light as well. This is a 3D Unity project, right? When you select anything in the hierarchy here, the inspector window over here like basically shows you all the properties of all the mono behaviors which are attached to this game object. So this game object has a transform and it has a camera. Uh, camera is also a subclass of mono behavior, right? <clears throat> so this is a component. And yeah, so you can see the properties of it. Position, rotation, these rotation values are rotation around the X, Y, and Z axis in degrees. And then scale is the size of the um, game object. All right, so it'll scale on the X, Y, and Z axis. It's a 3D thing. And then there's this camera thing attached. Directional light, you can see it's showing you the properties of directional light there. So this that's the hierarchy window. Things in the hierarchy window are hierarchical. So you can attach game objects to other game objects and they become parented. So we actually did transform parenting in using the processing libraries as well. If you guys remember, you know, when we had one thing attached to another and you move one ship and it moves the other ship. So that's exactly what happens when you parent transforms. So uh, the next window you have here is called the project window. And this shows you basically the file system. So this is all the assets that are in your project. Things like 3D models, C-sharp scripts, and so on. They're all listed there in the project thingy. Over here is the inspector. This is the console. So stuff that gets printed to the console gets printed here. And then this view is called the game view. So this shows you what the scene looks like from the perspective of this camera here. And then there's lots of little tools on the toolbar here that we can use to, like this one here basically drags the scene around like this. This one here allows you to select any of the game objects in the scene and drag them along their different axes. So you can drag them up and down. You can see that the position on the right there is actually changing as I'm dragging this thing up and down. So that's the camera. And you can drag it along the, uh, the, the X axis by, by dragging this thing here and so on. This next one is for rotation. So you can see you can rotate a game object like this and it changes the rotation. I'm rotating around the Y axis there. So you can see this angle value changes. I'll put everything back. This one here is the scale tool. This one here allows you to, I can't remember what that does. The rect tool does something. Uh, I think it allows you to change the, the scale of something. Um, by dragging its four corners around. We'll, we'll make a game object and we'll try these ones. I actually never use this button and I never use this button either. Okay, this moves, rotates and scales in one thing. That thing I don't think I've ever clicked on. Editor tool, okay. Pivot, this button is kind of important. But when it says pivot, um, this basically 
describes like around what point on a game object you are rotating. Usually you want pivot points because that's actually the object's position. But if it's center, what this is going to be like the average of all the vertices uh, on all of the child game objects as well. It's actually not so useful. It's better to set it to pivot in my experience. And this is local and global. So like if you, for example, take this here and rotate it, and then you switch between, let's see here again, I'll show you this thing. You switch between local and global. Local shows you the actual rotation of the game object. And global, when it's set to global, shows you these little, these little um, controls based on the world X, Y, and Z axis. So this is the fact that the thing is rotated. Awesome. Okay, cool. So we have a scene going on here in Unity. Let's make something in the scene. Usually what I do is I make a little tank that drives around and takes input from an Xbox controller and crashes into a wall. And that's sort of the Unity Hello World. Because we can see how all those classes then work in Unity. So let's begin. I'm going to right click on the scene here and I'm going to create a 3D object. There's different types of 3D objects you can create. You can create cubes, spheres, capsules, cylinders, and so on. Um, I'm going to create a, a quad, right? <clears throat> so a quad is basically everything in 3D is described using triangles. A quad is basically two triangles um, like made onto the sort of flat plane. And the quad actually is sort of like it's an upright quad like this. There we go, you can see it there. But what I actually want is I want this quad to be flat because I want to make it into a sort of a ground that the, the tank can drive on. So I'm going to take that quad. I'm actually going to set its position to be 0, 0, 0. And I'm going to do a 90 degree rotation on the X axis, which means the quad is going to be flat down rather than upright. And I'm going to change the scale on the quad. So I'm going to make the scale a uh, scale 100 by 100 on the X and the Y axis, right? So you can see the way it's made the quad now take up a big uh, space. One other thing I'm going to do here is select the main camera. I actually don't really like this default skybox in Unity. So I'm selecting the, the main camera and I'm going to change the clear flags to be a solid color and I'm going to make it a solid color. You can see I'm doing RGB values. So I'm going to, to be 0, 0, 0. All right, so it's 0, 0, 0. Cool. So there's my quad, right? Uh, I want to change the color on the quad. So this is how colors work in Unity. I'm going to right click on the assets folder and I'm going to click create a uh, material. So a material is uh, basically how you apply like textures and colors to things in Unity. So it says new material. I'm going to name this material. I'm going to call this uh, green. So this green material is going to be the color that's going to get applied to the quad. In order to assign the, the green color, I'm going to select the albedo. So you chain, you click on that thing there, and I want red, green, and blue. So it's 0, 1, and 0. So there we go. So I'm going to take the green, drag it onto the quad, and now the world is green. This is, this is great progress. Already we have a little world in the green world, that we can make a thing move around. I'm going to click Ctrl and S to save my scene. And then in order to run your game in Unity, you click this little play button up here. So here's the play button. And uh, what's going to happen is it's going to basically run the game. I guess it's running. So that's it. Nothing happens. Maximize on play. This window pops up and takes up the full screen. And there we go. There's the world. Fabulous. It's a world. It's a green world with a uh, black sky. All righty. Let's make something in this world that can move about, right? Let's make a little tank. So I'm going to make this tank out of two cubes. I'm going to click create on the 3D object. I'm going to click on cube. And there we go. Wow, look at that cube just pops in there, okay? For the position of the cube, I'm going to set it to be 0. And then 0 0.5 on the Y. And then 0 on the Z. And that's because I want the cube basically to sit on top of the plane I just made. So if the cube is of size 111, so you set the Y value to be 0 0.5. Whoa, somebody still chatting in the chat. He's, uh, okay, that's cool. The chat's all good. Stop that one. Stop recording. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, leave it open. Sorry, okay, never mind. Sorry, just got a bit distracted there. 
So there's the cube, right? Maybe I want to give a color to this cube. So I'm going to right click on the assets here and click create material. And now it's going to be a blue material. So maybe make this, call it blue. And the albedo is going to be zero, zero, and one. And then I've got blue material. And so I'm going to take the blue material and drag it onto the cube. And so now I've got basically a green cube, a blue cube inside uh, this little green world, okay? Now let's make a turret for the cube. And you get you get this, like, what we're going to do for this is, like, you, you'll basically understand how this, this transform parenting thing works, right? So maybe just take the cube, and I'm going to go Control-C, Control-V, so I get a copy of the cube. Now I want this cube to look like a sort of a turret. So I'm going to change it the scale on the X to be 0 0.1, we'll say. And on the Y, we'll set it to be um, 0 0.1 as well. So now it's a long, thin cube. And I'm going to set the position of this long, thin cube to be on top of this cube. So let's set its position to be 1. There it is, not 1.0. That's 1.05. And now it's going to basically be exactly on top like that. There you go. You can see it here. See this little square thingy? You click this square thing and it switches from, from sort of 2D, what's called orthographic projection, to perspective projection. So there's the cube on top, right? Uh, I wanted to kind of like drag it forward a bit. So, oh, there's the cube. And drag it forward. What? Okay. Drag the cube like this. There we go. So it's sticking out the top of the little other cube. That, of course, should be 0 0.5 and then it's exactly halfway along. And now see what I'm going to do with cube one? Select cube one, drag it onto cube, and it gets what's called parented to cube. So now there's this cube here, and if you, for example, take the bottom cube and you rotate it, <coughs> because the top cube is parented to it, it also rotates as well. So that's what parenting does. It attaches game objects to other game objects. So that's our tank, and you can actually, let's rename this to be tank. All right, so this is a little tank, right, for our game. These materials are how we assign colors. We haven't written any code yet, but nevertheless, we have this, like, scene that we can, you know, hit play. <coughs> if you really wanted to, you could deploy this to an Android phone, and this thing would pop up on an Android phone, <coughs> or a VR headset, and then you can actually go inside this little world that you've made. I think it's kind of amazing. Anyway, there's the tank, right? Uh, yeah, it does, like, yeah. Mohammed says, Unity's taking so long just to create a new project. I know. Sometimes it is slow to start, all right? And it's kind of annoying. <coughs> hey, you know what I might do? Actually, I might push this to a repo in about 10 minutes. Just if people want to get the code as we're going, up, going along and can commit it, you can get the code from a repo, clone the repo, or create a new project, you know? Anyway. Here's Tank. I want to now write a C-sharp script so that I'm going to take some input from a game controller and I want to move this tank around the place, right? So, in order for that to work, select the tank and then go down to Add Component here in the inspector and click Add Component. And we want to create a new script. So let's call this script uh, tank. So there's a new script, create an add. So here's the tank script, right? And let's go uh, edit script. So if you just click these little three ellipses here, and you can go edit script. By the way, to open your project in Unity as well, you can you can edit the scripts here. You can also go up to assets, and you can choose open C sharp project, and it will open up the the Unity project in Visual Studio Code for you. <clears throat> and you can go and edit this edit the scripts here in Visual Studio Code as well, right? So check this out, right? Expand the assets folder, and there is tank.cs. So tank.cs is the they're called scripts in Unity when you when you when you write C sharp code. So this is basically the tank thingy, the script that I just created by going add component and choosing tank. So this is a C sharp program, everybody. Wow, okay, so what is the significance of this? First of all, okay, it's a class. You can see it's the same as Java, it's a class. It's in a file called tank.cs. C sharp files don't have to be, it doesn't enforce that rule that Java enforces. In other words, like you can put a class in any file, it doesn't have to match 
the class name with the file name as Java does. Um, Java has this concept of packages. C Sharp has a thing called namespaces, which are essentially the same thing. So Java, you go import the package. In C Sharp, you go using the namespace. This is how you mean this. This this colon here means inheritance. This means inheritance, right? So this means tank extends mono behavior, <clears throat> and you can see that there's two methods on it. One called start and one called update. So start is a method that gets called by Unity when the scene starts. And um, update is a method that gets called once per frame. Alrighty. So let's write some code now in the update method to move this tank in response to input from either a game controller or the keyboard. And you would think this is going to be loads of code. Actually, it's not. Let's start. We'll do the simple thing first of all. Let's do this. Transform dot translate. So transform dot translate means move the transform. The transform is a field in the mono behavior. So you get it from, uh, by the way, C-sharp calls them base classes as opposed to Java, which calls them super classes. So it's from the base class, the mono behavior base class. All the C-sharp scripts that are attached to a game object share the same transform. So when you go transform dot translate in one mono behavior, it's the same transform and it's affecting the transform on all the mono behaviors which are attached to a game object. So transform that translate, let's just get it to move forward. Let's go zero, zero, and one. And this means move the position of this game object one unit every frame. Just to show you, like transform dot, you, there's lots of stuff there, right? Transform dot Euler angles gives you the the you know the rotation of the object in, in as a vector three. Transform dot forward. What did we call it? Did we call it forward? We called it dx and dy in C sharp. But it's essentially what you would add to the position in order to get this thing to move in the forward direction. When we program this in C in Java, we call these variables dx and dy, but that's basically what it is. It's a vector three. So you can get the components that are attached to a game object. It also has uh, things like the rotation, which is a quaternion type. And then there's things like rotate, so you can rotate the game object that way and so on. Anyway, let's just do this. Transform.translate001. Okay, so this is just going to move the position of that game object by one unit every frame. So let me switch back over into Unity. And this is like the hello world in Unity. This is like clicking the, the run button and seeing what happens. So we click play. And whoa! There goes the tank, everybody. And in fact, if you undo the maximize here, right, look at the tank. Look, you can see that its position on the Z is changing. Like every frame, we're adding one to the Z position of the tank. All right, so that's the transform.translate. Things in the real world move in kind of a slightly different way. They, well, not slightly different. They use a little bit of real physics. So we can code some slightly kind of real physics. Where's the C-sharp thingy gone again? Well, okay, here we go. We can code a little bit of real physics, right, to get it to move in a, in a, in a um, consistent way, right? So what we might want to do here is give a field for this game object, and, you know, for, for the speed of it, for the speed of the tank, right? So let's go public float speed, and let's give this value, let's give it the default value of 10. Now, like, I'm going to code a lot of stuff here, I'm thinking, I'm not going to be able to explain everything in like huge detail because we only have another, you know, 40 minutes or so left. But anyway, I'll do my best to sort of explain all the relevant stuff as we, as we do it. So anyway, this is the speed of this thing I wanted to move at, right? So um, what I've done here is made this a public field in the class tank. And when, it, when you make things public fields in Unity, Watch what happens now, right? Jump back over into the Unity Editor. And if I select the tank, now you can see there's this additional thing here for speed. And it says value 10, right? So you can make the speed here like a different number. And what happens is the value that you type into the Unity Editor overrides the value here in the 
C-sharp code, right? So the speed is not 10 anymore. When this thing gets instantiated, it will take the Unity, the value from the Unity editor that you type in there. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, that's how Unity works. And this is how you can like expose fields in Unity, sorry, expose C-sharp fields uh, to Unity. So public float speed 10, that's basically saying this thing's gonna travel 10 units per second. And now we can rewrite this code to take, to make use of that variable. We can say that's gonna be speed if you think of how things move in the real world, you might say I'm traveling at three meters per second for two seconds, so I will have traveled six meters. You take speed multiplied by time, and that gives you distance. And so that's exactly what we're gonna do here as well. We're gonna go speed multiplied by the time that has elapsed since the last frame. And you get that in Unity by going time.delta time. So time.delta time, if we're updating, we'll say at 60 frames a second, Time dot delta time will have the value of 1 over 60. So it'll be like how much time has elapsed since the last uh, frame update. I, I hope you guys get that. So let's save everything. Jump back over into Unity. And now uh, I can hit the play button there. It's traveling at 20 units a second, you know. But let's, let's, do, let's, let's just see how you can change that, right? So there's the tank, right? Its speed is currently 20. Looking at how the tank's position variable is changing, right? Let's make the speed minus 20 and make it go backwards. So you can actually modify this value as the, the game is actually running. And it feeds that value into that field in Unity. So wait, do you see, here we go. Comes the tank again. Coming towards me, because its speed is now minus 20. So you're able to literally interact with the, with the running Unity program you know, and modify the value of these variables at runtime. So there it is, okay? There's the tank driving at whatever speed, and you, you know, you get you get this like learning outcome of basically how you can expose fields from a C-sharp program into a Unity program. Okay, so that's transform.translate, right? I'm, I'm gonna, let's add some, some, some handling now for the game controller, all right? or for Im input, you know? So we're gonna take input and use that to drive the tank around. So, yeah. So let me just show you this in Unity. Unity has this concept called the input manager. So let's go to assets and then the properties window here in Unity. Uh, no, not, no, 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 not property. I wanna to go to assets and I want to go to, uh, no edit, sorry. Edit project settings, and here is input manager. All right, input manager basically maps strings from your C sharp program to things like the input value from a game controller. All right, so here's the input manager, and I see that there's a horizontal and vertical axis set up here. Uh, horizontal is taking input from the uh, let's see, key or mouse button from the X axis. Oh yeah, this is taking an input from the keyboard. So this is like the A and D keys, and also the left and right keys are gonna be basically mapped onto horizontal axis. Horizontal is actually specified twice. If you go out here again, you see horizontal again, and this time it's taking input from a joystick axis, and it's taking input from the X axis of a joystick. So the input manager basically, and you can create you know, new access and stuff like that in Input Manager. Anyway, over here in Tank now, right, let's take inputs from the Input Manager and map them onto movements of the tank. So transform.translate, let's rewrite this code to take input from the, um, the access, right? So instead of doing speed multiplied by time, not delta time, actually, let me show you this first of all, right? Input.getAccess, right? Input.getAccess is how you basically get value from an input device in Unity. Is the assignment now extended until the 7th of May? Yes. Input.getAccess, let's take the vertical axis. And let's just print that value out. Float A is going to be input.getAccess. And then we'll go debug.log. And we'll print that value of A. Oh yeah, debug.log basically prints things to the console. So let me save that. Jump back over into Unity and we'll just see what value comes up. Let me hit play here. 
I undo the maximize thing there as well. At the moment it's zero. And now watch what happens if I press W. It goes all the way up to one, and when I release W, it goes back down to zero. And then if I press S, it's gonna go between minus one and zero as well. The same with the up and down arrows. And I also have an Xbox controller plugged in here. So that also causes that value to go between zero and one. So, how do we incorporate that into the movement? You can take speed, multiply by time, dot delta time, and then multiply it by this value that comes from an input device. There we go, awesome. So now hitting play, and now as I move my Xbox controller, the little tank is driving forward and backwards. All right, let's make it rotate. So the rotation we're gonna do is gonna be based on the horizontal axis input. So there's lots of different versions of this rotate method. Like there's one that takes, you know, a vector three. There's other ones that take like X, Y, and Z values. And these are rotations around X, rotations around Y, and rotation around Z. So let's go zero. Um, now we need another variable for this because this, this is actually going to be in uh, degrees per second. So public float rotation speed. Let's say the rotation speed is going to be 90. So we're going to rotate at a, at a maximum speed of 90 degrees every second. And the rotation we're going to make is around the y-axis, right? So as I use the left stick here, I'm going to rotate around the y-axis. Okay, so let's go rotation, rotation speed, multiplied by uh, time dot delta time, same thing. And then it's going to be, wow, look at what the tab 9 thing has done. It's code completed. So we'll rotate around the horizontal axis like that. And then we need a third parameter, which is zero. Awesome, cool. Yay, so there's my little tank driving forward, backwards and rotating. So you see like just how with you know, not that much Unity knowledge and not that much code, you're able to make little worlds and make them come to life. So, and make things happen in them very, very easily. So that's that thing, right? I did say I was gonna commit this to a Git repo, so let me show you how this is gonna work, right? Commit it to a Git repo, and then I'll move up, we'll move on, and uh, we'll make the little wall for the tank to crash into, and one or two more little things. All right, so I'm gonna go onto GitHub here, Scooter 500, um, I'll make a new repo for this. And you guys can, if you want to, you can clone this repo and I'll put a link to it from the course repo. What did we call our Unity project? We called it Hello Unity. I hope I don't already have a project called Hello Unity. Fabulous. Already have one. Unity project. So it's public, add a readme file, add a git ignore file, and choose the unity git ignore file. Uh, let's make it an MIT license. Create the repository. So this is hello unity. I'm gonna jump over here into my folder. Documents. Oh yeah, it's just called hello unity. Here we go. Here's hello unity folder, right? I am gonna do git bash here. Get the bash going. You guys remember all of this, I hope? Git init. Initialize an empty git repository. Git remote. Add upstream. No, git remote add origin. And then we paste the URL. Git pull. Oh, get pull argin master. 
Git pull origin master to get the git ignore file and to get the readme file. Most importantly, the git ignore file because you want the git ignore file in your repo before you do your first commit. So let's do the commit now. Git add dot. Git commit minus m. Uh, let's just call it hello. Git push. Git push minus minus set upstream origin master to create the link between the R, uh, master branch here and the master branch on the remote so there we go and i'll just share this into the chat with you guys if you want you can clone this repo uh all the code from today will be in the repo yeah there you go all right so okay so we've got our tank moving about uh let's do something nice with the camera right so the camera at the moment is just fixed in one location all right let's make the camera follow the tank right so how i uh, this is like a third person camera controller we're going to make for the tank here all righty okay cool. what are we going to do so first of all let's make a point on the tank that we want the camera to be at all the time so i'm going to right click on the tank and choose create empty i'm going to call this cam pause cam pause right and I'm going to drag this to a point on the tank that I want the camera to try and find. So there's cam pause. It's a child of the tank as well, right? So that means when the, uh, the tank moves, cam pause is also going to move with it. So I placed it basically behind the tank and sort of like centered over the tank, right? So on the camera, I'm going to add a script here and I'm going to call this uh, camera follow. Use new script, create an ad, and then as I did previously, you can click on the little ellipses there, and you can choose edit script, and it pops it open in Visual Studio Code. Now, this uh, camera follow thing needs to know like, where is it going to try, where is it going to try and find the, uh, where is it going to try and move to. So you need to make a public field here. of type transform and let's call this uh, cam pause so every frame what I want to do is I want to try and bring the camera's position you could parent the camera but it wouldn't look as nice because it means the camera is just going to be fixed constantly much nicer is to get the camera to sort of move slowly and then track the track the tank right so anyway in update, what do I want to happen? You guys, maybe you can figure this out. We can use a lerp, okay? We lerp the camera's position towards that uh, endpoint, and then it will sort of like slowly reach the target pause, right? So let's go update, and like it's going to be camera. Ah, no, no, oh, transform dot position. So this gives you the <clears throat> position of the game object. Transform dot position equals vector3 dot uh, lerp <clears throat> from transform to the position to cam pause uh, dot position and we'll use time dot delta time so this is the lerping thing you know that we have you know, we've done lerping before uh, this basically because it's, it's basically saying move the camera's position towards the the position of uh, this transform thing, which is a field, and then it's going to move it slowly towards it, or move it like a little bit every frame. So let's pick main camera. Here's the cam pause, and let's drag the cam pause onto the cam pause thing here. And now let's hit the play button and see what happens with the camera. The camera. Yay! So that moves the camera a little bit towards this thing, and then if I drag my tank. The camera sort of follows it, but it's a little bit behind it, right? That's that. Okay. Oh, yeah, the camera rotation. We need to get the camera to rotate. So, where are we? Let's go back into the C-sharp code here. Camera.position equals that. And now let's do the camera rotation. Transform.rotation equal No, transform.lookat. That would be the best thing. Transform.lookat. You know, like, again, there's a lot of Unity sort of like APIs and stuff here um, that were sort of like brief, just, you know, introducing and moving on very quickly. Uh, if we had more time and 
again, if you want to know more about this, my class in fourth year is all about Unity programming. So I will explain what all of these things do in due course. So transform.lookat. Now I want to look at the parent of the compos thing because I want to look at the body of the tank. So how that would look would be transform dot uh, transform dot uh, parent. There we go. Cool. That's it. Look at transform dot parent. No, not transform dot parent. It should be look at compos dot parent. Compos dot parent. So the parent of the camera thingy. Awesome. See what that looks like. Hit play. So now on my rotating, I'm not only moving and lurping towards that position, but I'm also uh, rotating so that I'm, I'm 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 always looking at the body of the tank, and then you can see the tank is driving and the the camera is able to follow it and so on. Okay, fantastic. So I now want to make something for the tank to crash into. And so let's make a little wall and like this, you know, we can have a bit of fun with this. We can, we can basically write like a nested for loop to create this wall. So let me go create empty here and I'm going to choose a, create a new game object and I'm going to call it wall. And then I'm going to click add component and I'm going to add a new script called wall. So it's going to be a new script. There's loads of stuff. We could even explore this as like how you create game objects from other things. And we could get into prefabs and stuff, but uh, let's just make our wall here. Okay. Ooh, yeah. So here we go. Wall. I'm now going to maybe make some public fields on this. Public int. Let's go width. And say so the width of this wall is going to be like 10 cubes wide. No, not 100. 10 will do fine. And then public int height is going to be equal to, so it's going to be 20 high, okay? So we've got 10 by 20 wall. And I want this code this time to get executed in the start method rather than in the update method because I don't want it to happen every frame. I just want to one time create all of the, um, the wall elements and yeah. That's it. Just needs to happen in start. So this is, you know, you guys can figure this out. This is going to be a nested loop. Let's go for int. Uh, let's go column equals zero. Semicolon column is less than the width. Semicolon call plus plus. And we're going to make a row of uh, row of blocks now, right? There's, there's, there's several ways you can create game objects from code. One way is to create the game object from a primitive type. The primitive types are things like cubes, spheres, and capsules, right? Uh, you can also, you know, create the game object from what's called a prefab, but maybe that's something for another class, right? Let's go game object. Ooh, F12. Game object. Geo is going to be equals to game object dot create primitive create primitive awesome here we go and then the first parameter here is a primitive type so primitive type dot and then you choose whether you want a capsule a cube a cylinder let's make cubes so let's make our cubes cool awesome oh, oh, go back to game object created and now I want to set the position of the game object. Let's make another int here for row. Do this a little bit, bit by bit. Let's say row is equals to zero. So I want to assign its position. So I'm going to go go dot transform dot position is going to be equals to new vector three. Vector three. Uh, let's see. So let's use the uh, let's use the column, and let's use the row, and on the z. Sorry, this is x, y, and z. Yeah, let's use zero on the x, y, and z. Now I'm gonna type some code here, and I'm gonna like just maybe explain it to you guys as best I can. But you know, it's something that if we had a longer class, um, you know, I'd be able to spend a bit more time on it. In fact, I'm gonna change this so it's not actually setting that position. I'm gonna go vector three for the position is going to be equals to that so then I'm going to go transform 
dot position. Instead of assigning the position directly from P, I'm going to do this. Transform dot transform point P. So, uh, like, you know, you can just assign the position variable directly, but this is better because what actually happens here is the position variable is now in what's called the local space. So it's, it's, it's like, and when you do transform dot transform point, it uses the, the objects transform, the walls transform to actually transform the point. In other words, if the wall was moved to a different position, then that point would also get moved to that position. And if the wall was rotated, that point would also get rotated as well. Um, yeah, because we don't have too much time. Otherwise, I'd spend a bit more time on this and we'd like show what happens if you don't do transform.transform point. I also want this thing to be rotated. So transform.rotated, so that if the, this thing which is spawning the wall is rotated, all the blocks are also rotated. So transform.rotation, no, 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 that should be geo game object dot transform dot position. And then this should be geo dot transform dot rotation is going to be equals to transform dot rotation. Okay, so this is, yeah, cool. Here we go, game object, that's it. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. All right, so we kind of have a bit of a walk. This is, uh, I would also like it to be sort of centered around the game object as well. So maybe instead of going for column equals zero, columns less than width, it might make more sense to go something like this. Int half w is going to be equals to width divided by two. And then go something like this for column equals minus half w up as far as half w. So it makes more sense to, to do that, yeah? Half w. Right, because it's going to be centered. Awesome. Let's see what this looks like. This is so exciting. I'm going to press uh, Alt tab. Let's switch over to Unity. Here's the wall. Let's move the wall. It's at 0, 0 0.5, and 0. That's perfect. Uh, let's move the wall to a slightly different position. There's the wall. I'm going to put the wall here in front of the player. And now through the magic of code, we are going to make a wall. Let's hit the play button. Fabulous. There you go. Through code, we have created reality. Now, the cool thing here is like, if you actually put a VR headset in, you would literally see a wall in front of you. And you will have made that wall out of code. <clears throat> I find that amazing. Okay. Let's color the wall. All right, so we can go go dot get component, <clears throat> and get component is how you retrieve one of the mono behaviors that is attached to a game object. And this primitive that we've just made, this cube will have a renderer. You know, I mentioned renderers at the start. You know, when I was talking about the different classes that you're going to interact with. So this will get the renderer that's attached to that game object, and then. This gets the material. Material is how you assign colors. And then you can change the color of the material to be, let's make a random color. HSB, no, hang on, it's color. We call the static method HSB to RGB. And we're gonna pass in, this is how you make random numbers, random.range, 0.0f, comma 1.0f. So that's gonna make a random number between zero and one. And we pass in one and one for the other parameters. Number colors in Unity go between 0 and 1 as opposed to going between uh, 0 and 255 like they do in the processing library. So that's going to assign those things to have a random color. So we save, switch back over into Unity. This is when it kind of gets a bit exciting because now we're going to add like little bits of code and we're going to see this thing, you know, sort of come to life a little bit more. Whoa, look at that, a little color for the wall. And at the moment, you can't crash into those those little colorful walls. Just the thing drives through them. Okay, but well we have our little tank tank going on. Okay, how are we going to make those things respond to physics? We need to add a couple more components. <clears throat> we need to add go dot add component. And we're going to add a rigid body component. Rigid body is going to make that thing be physically simulated. So you go add component rigid body. That's it. Now we'll have physics. Alrighty, let's switch over here. Now it's position. The position of all of those things is actually going to be controlled by the 
physics engine, which is built into Unity. So now I can drive, oh, and look, as I kind of crash into those things, they now move about. They're physically simulated to some degree. The tank needs a little bit of work, though. We need to also add a rigid body to the tank. So I'm going to select the tank here in the hierarchy. Click Add Component Rigid Body. And I'm also going to make this a, what's called a kinematic rigid body. Kinematic rigid bodies in Unity basically says that the tank script is going to look after the position of this thing rather than the physics. Uh, again, it's like something that we would get into in a little bit more detail, but I'll just say it for now. And now you can look and see the tank like is able to crash into these things and uh, the collisions are you know accurately detected all right last thing we'll do let's build the wall higher build the wall who said that gold star in the chat for whoever tells me who is the guy that builds walls apart from myself out of code all right let's do this uh, nest this for loop let's go for int call uh, sorry row is equals to zero uh, row is less than the height row plus plus oh yeah get rid of row then oh and indent all of these guys here Delete row like that. Awesome. Uh, row, row, is this the height? Yes, it is Trump, of course. Trump should have just learned Unity. And then you see all you need to do is just change the variable uh, value in the Unity editor and you can build a wall as big as you like. Okay. So now we've got row equals zero, rows less than height, row plus plus. And we're using the row as part of the position of it. And we're translating, yes, nice. Okay, cool. So. I'm actually thinking here, I want to leave a small gap and let the wall kind of like fit together a little bit nicely. So let me go row, multiply by, I think this is going to work, 1.1f. So this is going to leave like a 10% gap between each of the uh, bricks on the row, on the, on the wall. So so here's a wall, it's got a height of 20 and it has a width of 10. So I'm going to hit the play button now. And so we get a cool little wall going on. Yay! And look, the tank can drive into the little wall and crash into all the little blocks. And so now you have like a little child's playground of colorful blocks. We can even see how far we can take this now because we have pretty much everything. Let me show you the code there, right? There's the code. You can see now I'm basically like creating the wall just using a nested for loop. So like this is, you know, how the Unity APIs work, but also you can see that like you know, from code, you can now uh, create this little reality thing going on, you know? Anyway, there's the wall. Um, let me maybe turn off that camera thing. I'm going to turn off the camera follow. You can disable components just by clicking the buttons like that. So maybe I'll make the, make the, the camera come back a little bit further. And we'll see how big a wall uh, Unity can make. There's the camera. So I'm going to hit the play button here, just see what it looks like. So you can see the wall getting created. There's my wall of height 20, and then it's going to have a width of 10. So you've got a little world here. You know, again, I, I can't, perhaps I should have, and maybe this is something for another class, I should have my VR headset on here. Because the amazing thing is like literally from the language of code, you can create a reality to, to which you can actually go. I find that incredible. You write code, and then look. Reality, amazing. Anyway, uh, perhaps the actual universe is running somewhere inside uh, the Unity plus plus game engine in a different dimension, the fourth dimensional version of Unity. Anyway, well, let's see. Uh, has anyone seen The Matrix? Have you seen the movie The Matrix? This is very Matrixy. Okay, like I say, reality is code. Alrighty. Um, just to show you, like you can change that height variable. Let's go 100. So now we've got a wall of size 100. There we go. And all those bricks just fall in like that. 100. Unity will happily do 100. 
it's going to slow down. You can click the stats there and you'll see it will slow down a little bit. Um, you know, as you've got loads of objects colliding with each other. Let's see, will it do 500? So this is literally 500 my, my, my test. So this is 5,000 game objects. There you go. Five thousand, a wall of size, uh, five thousand, and then you can see Unity's really chugging along because you've got too many game objects. Guys, that's kind of all I really wanted to show you with Unity. I mean, I think we kind of think about wrapping up. You know, uh, what I wanted to just sort of learn from this little exploration of Unity is number one, how easy it is to get into like coding things and making things literally out of code, and the number two thing was like that you can understand. You know, this is how OOP works in like the real uh world you know this is how oop works in unity like you got game objects you got mono behaviors you got transforms you have renderers you have rigid bodies you got colliders you can see how all of these classes kind of fit together in you know a big like very popular game engine what can i show you guys before we finish up oh and i do need to say like wow because we're almost finished let me just go and uh i showed you i'm pretty sure i showed you this guys you can go like Unity, like I say, is, is so amazing once you get into the coding of the Unity thing. Oh, maybe I already have it open. I want to open up the ECS project, ECS 2020. Uh, I've loads of Unity uh, with this project open. Where? Let me close it. Close window. Okay, ECS 2020. You know, it's a great, when do you get the lab test results? you got to give me a while. I haven't even started, looked at them yet. Um, imminently, as soon as I have them graded. ECS 2020 doesn't seem to want to load for me. Oh, now it's working. Yay. Oh, I know what I'll show you. Let's see, infinite forms. ECS 2020 build, this will probably work just straight off. So one of the things I use Unity for is making, um, oh, it's actually starting in the wrong window. Yeah, it, I use it for making uh, visuals for musicians. And that's starting in the wrong window. How do I make that start in the other window? I think if I change my stream to show the other window, it might just work. Uh, still loading here we go it's running in the other window but I'll just change the stream to switch to the other window hopefully you'll be able to do this uh, over at OBS here now I need to add another thingy it's called scene 3 and then I'm going to add a display capture uh, there we go display capture this one or this one excellent here we go so I'm going to switch over to this one here. Yeah, so you can just see, these are just some of the Unity uh, little experiments that I've been working on recently. This is the Cytron Spiral Generator. This is all made in Unity. Um, yeah, and then this thing is the Game of Life in Unity. And then this thing is the ECS Voids. This is a simulation of artificial life. You know, where all these guys have different behaviors, separation, cohesion, and alignment, wander, constraint, and they do all kinds of amazing things. And you get amazing emergence as well. You can make these little cool worlds, you know, and make creatures and make like things that have, you know, intention and behaviors. And yeah, that's why I find Unity so fascinating. Okay, you guys, listen, that is the end of uh, today's class. I just want to say before uh, like I finish that uh, it's been a pleasure to run these classes this semester with you guys. It has really been like, you know, lots of fun for me and like this has been, you know, not exactly the nicest time for any of us, but definitely coming here every Monday and doing yoga with you guys occasionally, doing a bit of Vim Hop reading, uh, writing like nice computer programs in uh, Java to draw pictures and move little things around the screen by themselves and respond to audio has been great fun. And it's been great fun like getting to know you guys a little bit through Teams and seeing your work and you know all I can say is I'm really looking forward to seeing what your assignments are going to be like I'm just so excited uh, it's a great pleasure for me to grade all of those assignments uh, every year 
And uh, that's it, you guys. That is, oh yeah, hang on. We got a tutorial on Thursday, and then uh, we got the lab on Wednesday, which will be working on the um, working on the assignment. But that is basically the last OOP class. And it was my pleasure. Wish you guys every success and happiness. Hoping that we can all meet in the new campus in September. And uh, have a great summer, everybody. That's the end of the class. Bye-bye. Miss you. Mwah.